All right. So welcome back to another episode with the Sports Doctor. And this is another great Money Mondays segment uh, with Ms. Karen Hall. So in brief introduction, uh, Ms. Hall is the CEO of Udirect IRA. And we're going to get into her journey about how she became CEO. She's been now over this business now for 13 years. So she brings a wealth of knowledge to this uh, podcast. And we're really glad to have you here with us today. Are you interested in real estate? Are you tired of hearing about all the money that your friends and colleagues are making from their investments, but you don't know where to start? Don't worry, I got you. We are teaming up with Dr. Ronnie Shalev and Shawin Properties to equip you with the tools you need to feel empowered about your investments. So how do you get involved? Do these three things. First, go to my website at drderekthesportsdoctor.com and click on the sponsor link for Shawin Properties. This will give you access to a free webinar, as well as the ability to have a discovery call with Dr. Ronnie Shalev. Also follow her on social media and stay tuned for more helpful tips coming at you on Money Mondays. Now back to the episode. Thank you. This is uh, it's great to be here. I love talking about money on Monday, so. There you go. <laughs> right, right time, right place. All right. So she is recommended to our show by uh, Matt McFarland and Amanda Hahn, who did a great episode on uh, labeled it protecting the bag, how to keep your money, the hard earned money that you work for. So if you have not listened to that episode, please go back because they shared many great strategies about how to save on Texas and also the relationship that you should have with your CPA more than just um, doing your taxes at the end of the year. So today, you know, that was a kind of a basic episode. Now we're going to dive into one of the best kept secrets, I think, of investing, which is self-directed IRA. So uh, just start off by telling us kind of the journey of how you made it to be CEO of your own company. Yeah, I mean, it it was a long journey. You know, it, it didn't just I didn't just wake up one day and think I want to self direct IRAs. <laughs> but yeah. I was a radio announcer. You know, and, and when I was uh, like in college and so forth, and then out of college for a while. But then I realized I want to make some money, and I got involved in real estate in lots of different aspects. So while I was still on air, I would manage uh, some property buildings, uh, some you know some multifamily buildings in Seattle. And then I also became a realtor for a year in Seattle and I did all this. So I was really busy just working, working. And then I moved out of Seattle and um, down to LA and got involved in mortgage loan servicing. Boy, I learned a lot. I mean, you learn a lot when you understand how the mortgage industry works and how loans work. And it was a great education. And, and I was in that space for about eight years. Uh, and then I transitioned into the, uh, into the loan origination space. And that was really a challenge. I mean, it's, that's, that's a tough job. You know, people will, you'll work with them for months and then they leave you for an eighth of a point, you know, <laughs> but okay. it was such a great education and, and it was, you know, it was profitable. It was a great thing. I really, I really did enjoy it. But then of course we had the recession. And so that changed the game for a lot of people. And I got a job at a self-directed IRA company, worked there for a couple of years and started off on my own. So that was 2009. And it was like the best time to open a self-directed IRA company. And the reason is because there was all this real estate that was like just on sale because the foreclosures and so, so forth. And it was just starting to happen in 2009, the foreclosures. And so, well, banks, they just locked up, you know, they weren't going to lend money to investors. And so investors are like, where do we find the money? Well, guess what? They could tap into what is today a $40 trillion pool of funds for their deals. So if any of the people listening today are raising capital or want to partner with somebody on one of their transactions, a self-directed IRA can can partner on a deal. It's great. Well, this is how the investors, the investor community really found self-directed IRAs because they've been around since 1975, probably before a lot of people listening or even born. So it's been around a long, long time. And it's just an excellent tool. And and it's just no right place and right time. Most important, when you were a DJ or when you were, you said, uh, in radio, what type of radio show did you have? <laughs> I did Light Rock, Let's Talk, K-Light, 98.7 <laughs> FM, right? <laughs> nice, nice, is, nice. You know, I okay. love that. 
that was that was fun. Yes. Smooth jazz is funny. That's what I go to sleep to a lot. So <laughs> oh, it's the best. It's and, yeah. and it's funny how those songs are timeless. So those, those right, two. absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about 2009 because you kind of set the stage. But 2009, you know, a big financial downturn, but a lot of that was caused by big banks. So, yes, with lending, a lot of people were getting loans that maybe they didn't even really qualify for and ended up leading to their recession. So you mentioned that was a great time for you direct IRAs or to go into self-directed um, lending. Why would you say so at that point when people were kind of scared already? Well, they couldn't get money from banks and they had deals okay. in process. And so banks where it's, if you're an investor, usually you can get like six to 10 loans. If you have, the, the number will change, but if you have like five mortgage loans out already, you want to get a sixth, you're a real estate investor. Usually you can do that, but banks weren't so willing to give you, give investors a lot of loans because of the risk. And so the need for capital was really, really accelerated, especially during those years. And self-directed IRAs provided the answer. So it was sort of a grassroots kind of solution to the problem because by investing in these properties, have the IRAs investing in these properties, it grew people's retirement uh, so that they could afford to retire. It was, it was a really a perfect storm. All right. And so, you know, my audience, we have a lot of health professionals, a lot of uh, young professionals, entrepreneurs, athletes. So. I'm gonna, we wanna have this conversation for me on a very elementary level, right? So we're not talking to CPAs. So let's start off finding some just kind of basic terminology about what, how does a self-directed IRA differ from a traditional IRA or traditional 401k? Mm -hmm. Right, so it, like the typical IRA invests in stock market type of assets, cor market correlated assets. That could be a CD, could be stocks, could be mutual funds and all these other different things, but it's tied to the, the stock market. But with a self-directed IRA, it is tied to alternative assets. Now understand an IRA is an IRA, it's one thing, but what makes it self-directed is truly self-directed is when you're investing outside of Wall Street. So like your IRA can buy a house and the renters pay your IRA the rent, for example, or your IRA can invest in private equity. Maybe somebody is, you know, has a fund and they're building an apartment building or something, and your IRA or solo 401k or HSA, all these different accounts can uh, self-direct into deals like your self-directed account can hold physical precious metals, you know, we'd store them for you. Different things, notes, you could buy performing and non-performing debt. So lots of different asset classes. Okay. And once they, someone invests into a solo 401k account or whatever health savings account, what are some of the rules about what they can and cannot use that money for? Yeah, that, that, is, that is the key, the rules. It's not like investing your own money because this is tax protected money. So in order to get that tax protection, the IRS wants you to follow certain rules. And so here they are. You need to avoid what's called a prohibited transaction. So what makes it prohibited, right? Well, it starts off with some people being disallowed to your IRA. So Disallowed people are your ascendants and descendants. Just think it like up and down the family tree. Parents and grandparents, you and your own spouse, children and grandchildren, disallowed to the IRA. Okay, so I'll explain how that works. Now your nieces and nephews and your aunts and uncles, they're okay. You know, your cousins, fine, but not anybody up and down the family tree, right? Plus a 50-50 business partner, but I don't want to get too into this. So there we go. Okay. Some people are disallowed. So here's the thing. So a disallowed person can't benefit from the IRA today. So here's one of the rules. Your IRA isn't going to lend money to your spouse so they can go open a business because that's a disallowed person receiving present benefit from your retirement account, prohibited transaction. For example, your IRA wouldn't purchase a property, say, say uh, your parents' estate and your IRA wanted to purchase a, no, you can't do that because your parents are disallowed to the IRA. And frankly, if it's the estate, you probably have an ownership interest in that too, and you're disallowed. Um, your IRA isn't going to make a loan to your kids to go to college they're disallowed. But similarly, another rule is that you're not allowed to provide what's called services to the plan. You know, little air quotes there, you know. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah. So this is an example. We had somebody buying real estate and they had a common last name. And so we're looking through the docs and we see at the very back, wait a minute, the listing agent has the same last name. So we, we sent him an email or talked to him on the phone and said, hey, are you related to this person? You guys have the same last name. He says, oh yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> Well, 
He couldn't do that deal. A father is a disallowed person. He can't offer services to the plan even for free. Okay, but the dad also wanted a commission. So that would be two prohibited transactions, right? So he, basically it's the kind of thing where the dad needed to give that particular deal to somebody else in the office to handle and, and he should stay away. Just stay arm's length away from the disallowed people and you're pretty much okay. Okay, and how do you learn about these prohibitive transactions and what you can and cannot do? What's the best way to learn? Well, I have a lot of podcasts. Udirect has a great uh, YouTube channel. If you're a rule book kind of person and uh, the listeners may very well be that, you can go to irs.gov and look up IRC 4975, Internal Revenue Code 4975, lists all the rules uh, exactly as they're written. So the prohibited transactions are all there in the Internal Revenue Code. That's kind of heavy reading, but, or, or they could just call and ask. And then we would, you know, we always give a 20 minute consultation to anybody that's interested. Great, great. So talk to us about being able to have a traditional 401k and this in addition to it. So let's talk about the first, maybe the different kinds of accounts. So you could have yeah. the IRA, the, like two worlds, IRA and 401k side, but the IRA is a traditional, a Roth, a SEP, simple, a spousal, an inherited IRA. Okay, those are the IRAs. And then you might also have self-directed, like a solo 401k. You referred to that before. So just to kind of definitions. Mm -hmm. The solo pay is for somebody who is self-employed, has no full-time employees in any of the companies that they own, right? And they it, it gets a 401k, it gives you a lot of bells and whistles. Like it's a great account. You have two sides to it. Part of it can be pre-tax and then the other part can be Roth, uh, which means that that money can grow tax-free. That's huge. You can take a loan from a 401k where you're not going to take a loan from an IRA. So just a little bit about the differences. Now, say, for example, you have a 401k where you work and you want to open an IRA. You can do that. It just requires filing a special little form. Just tell your tax person and they just you know, check a box to say that you have both a 401k and an IRA. That is allowed. Uh, but all these accounts have contribution caps. So it depends upon your age your account type and your income, you know, your contribution amount it depends on those things. Uh, so say, for example, if, if you want a Roth IRA and you make over, say, like $130,000 a year, you might not be even able to contribute directly to a Roth. That's why they call it the backdoor Roth. You might be able to contribute to a traditional right. IRA, you know, and convert. Mm -hmm. That's possible. So hopefully that answered your question. Sure, sure. And then what are some of the terms as far as being able to access this money once you put it into uh, one of the self-directed IRAs? It's always your money. You know, it's always your money. So you can always have it. Now, whether or not you're penalized is the question. So once you hit the age of 59 and a half, you can take the money out of your accounts without a penalty. But there are other reasons why you can take your money out without penalty, like uh, maybe for education or your first time home buyer or some sort of hardship. I have a, a list of these things on the UDirect website. There's a blog article about it. There's a, a list of them where you can take money out without penalty, but you might still have to pay the tax. Okay. So why is this such a kind of a well-kept secret, so to speak? I know that I've been actively searching for self-directed 401ks, and it's hard to find people that have the information or the knowledge about this. Right. I sit on the board of directors for our industries organization. It's called RETA, the Retirement Industry Trust Association. And in a nation as big as we are, there are maybe 40 companies. So it, there aren't a lot of companies that do this, but where you're going to find, you know, really hear about it is when you hang around the real estate investor community, when you go to meetups or conferences, this is going to come up and, and the people in those areas are really, really familiar with this tool. Got it. And this is a good way to be able to find some of the, your own investments, correct? Right. And so understand that the retirement account is for later. It's not for now. So you do. So everything you do in this retirement account is to save for your future self. You're not going to be able to pay your bills using the money that you earn in, in right. with this. But for example, it's also great because maybe you've got a friend doing a deal and they just need a little bit of money or maybe they need a lot of money to finish out what they're doing. Your IRA can get into that deal in a debt or equity position. So they could be the IRA could be part owner or the IRA could loan money. Um, with, you know, conditions and terms, maybe it's secured, that sort of thing. And so those things can happen. So we can help each other to be better investors in this way. Sure, sure. And you mentioned tax-free versus tax-deferred. Will you kind of define that for us? 
The Sabre training bat is like no other training bat you've ever used before. So the purpose of the Sabre training bat with its modified barrel is so that you can perfectly sequence and get behind the ball, getting the bat on plane sooner, creating less miss hits, more line drives, higher batting averages, and more exit velocity. The Sabre training bat is the number one training bat on the market. Sabre Bats, the training bat that's gonna take you to your best swing. Yeah, I'm happy to. So a Roth IRA can be tax-free. A uh, Roth IRA is the newest IRA. It's been, it's been around for quite a while, but it's the newest of the IRAs. And so with the, when you contribute to a Roth, the money is after tax. So you already pay tax on that money. And you put the contribution in the Roth account. And then any proceeds from that contribution, any you know, gain, uh, can be tax-free as long as you meet two qualifying conditions. And that's usually having that Roth or a Roth for five years and being 59 and a half. So you meet those qualifying conditions and then you can take the, the proceeds out tax-free at the end. Okay, versus tax deferred, kind of just define that for us. Yeah, like traditional IRA it, and a lot of 401ks are tax deferred. So the money goes in and you may or may not be eligible for a tax break, that's great. So the money goes in, you haven't paid tax on it yet. And then just like the Roth IRA, all the growth is deferred. It's just sitting in there, not being taxed. But with a traditional IRA or with a, like a regular 401k, when the money, it's taxed when it comes out. So it's not taxed now, it's taxed later. And when it comes to these kinds of accounts where the money goes in deferred of tax, later on, you have to take an RMD, a required minimum distribution. So when you, it used to be 70 and a half, now it's 72. It's probably going to go up to 75. When you hit this age, then you have to take the money out and pay tax to, to kind of give you the life cycle. Of the okay. And then also one thing that's really big, I think, in this realm that we're dealing with is health savings accounts. Um, will you kind of speak to that and what a health savings account is and how it can be utilized? Yeah, it's a sophisticated tool if you're going to use it for investing, but it is so powerful because like a Roth, the money goes in after tax. Actually, in this case, it goes in pre-tax. So let me, it's kind of like the best of both worlds. So when you mm -hmm. contribute to an HSA health savings account, it's money that you have not been taxed on. You may get a deduction for making that contribution. And then the money grows and you can use it to pay bills. You know, you, you can use it to like in any kind of healthcare bills, or you can just take the money and invest it and all the proceeds will come out tax-free at the end. But in order for it to come out tax-free, you have to have like medical bills that equal the amount of your withdrawal. And I guess I should mention too, if you want to qualify and have an HSA, first, you have to have a high deductible health plan, HDHP. So a lot of employers offer them. It's usually part of their cafeteria plan of, you know, different kinds of, uh, of accounts you can have. So first you have a health, high deductible health plan, then you can have an HSA. Contribution limits aren't as high. Um, I think for a family, it maybe it's around 7,000 for a family. An individual is much less. So the contribution limits aren't as high. But it is, it's a really powerful tool to get the tax break in and the tax break out. It's really the best of all worlds. But you just need to make sure you maintain it correctly. Yeah, and you mentioned that you can pay down your health bills, but can you also use it for uh, paying down like daycare and things of that nature? Or is that a different type of account? That's a different type of account. Yeah, sometimes I... When, when my kids were little, that's what I had. I had that, that different type of account where you contribute mm -hmm. through your employer and you have to, it's a health savings account where you have to use it all by year end or you lose it. This is a different kind of account. It's, it is called an HSA health savings account. It's not the, the other type, an employer type. Uh, based okay. On. Okay. But I mean, this is important right now when we have so many insurances with these, you know, $5,000, $7,000 deductibles. And to be able to come out with that money out of pocket sometimes can really cause a financial strain. So health savings accounts, I think, are you know something that I've been able to utilize and that really come in handy. Yeah. And especially as people get older, I mean, you I mean you're a doctor who knows better than you how when people get older, the older you are, usually the more medical bills you have. So it's a great way to be a friend to yourself and be ready for that. Mm -hmm. Since you brought that up, can we talk about uh, long-term kind of care? Does that fall under the same self-directed IRAs or is that different? 
It can be uh, there. There, I, I have to look it up because I, I believe the premiums for long-term care uh, insurance are a deductible. You know, it's something you can pay for with a uh, high deductible health plan. I'd have to double check, but I believe the premiums for long-term care, but no other kind of insurance. And what else would you say that's kind of that a health professional or that a young entrepreneur, how should they be investing for their retirement? Because we know that the traditional 401k, you know, when we turn 70, will there be any money out there for us? <laughs> you know, so just kind of speak to that. Right. Well, I mean, I can speak to it personally because I'm, you know, one day I'm going to retire. I'm in this business, so I better be able to do that. Right. Yeah. And what I've learned is that retirement is when you prepare for it, it's layers, you know, layers of things that are going to happen for you. Like say social security, that's one layer. Maybe you've got an annuity, which is kind of an insurance product. Maybe you've got a 401k, maybe you've got, you know, some, an IRA too. And it's layer upon layer of different assets. Maybe you bought a rental property and the rental property is, you know, spewing off some rent and, and little cash. So you're, what, to prepare for retirement, uh, our account holders, they're layering with different streams of income. And so when you choose an asset, I mean, this is self-directed, so we don't advise what you should invest in. We tell you what you can put into a self-directed account, but you just, you just definitely want to start planning layers as soon as possible. And don't think that retirement is so far away because it does take a while to, to prep for it. And you're going to be that age at one point in time faster than you think. So good to start now. And do you have any calculations? I know this is, everyone's going to be different for, but how much money should a person have for you know retirement, yeah, there's no gold. Income. Yeah, yeah, there's there's no real golden number. This is a great question for a financial advisor, but I think that it depends upon what your expenses are. I mean, if you you know live here in California and you're paying you know four thousand dollars a month in yeah. rent, and <laughs> you know um, that's one. It depends on what your monthly nut is and what you're going to need. So you need to kind of back into the number based on your expenses and factor in inflation and. And come up with that number. But this is where a financial advisor comes in really handy to help you come up with that number. And then a self-directed IRA is a tool that you use to get to that. You know, you find alternative assets through and use a self-directed IRA to acquire them um, so that you can hit that number. I love that. So I was joking with Matt and Amanda about when yeah, sometimes I'll talk to my financial planner and they say, no, that's an accounting question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's true because if we, when we started yeah, giving absolutely. tax advice, you know, just it's like, you know, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to give me legal advice. You're not a lawyer. So I'm, right. maybe, you know, something, but it's, it's different. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when someone comes to you and they're ready to invest, what's that process look like? It's pretty easy. So the whole process goes like this. You open an account and at the most, it takes a day. Once we get, you know, an application and a, a copy of your ID and so forth, get your account open. Then you can log in. You've got an account online. You can see it. Um, and that's great. The second step is to fund the account. So you can contribute from your own you know, checkbook. You've got a, a cap of how much you can contribute every year, but you could make a contribution. You could, if you have like an IRA elsewhere, maybe at Schwab or you know, TD Ameritrade, Northwestern Mutual, you can transfer that. So to do that, you fill out our transfer form. It's part of our application. You sign it, give it to us, we sign it. We send it to your custodian, they move your money. So that's, you fill out a form basically is what you do for that. And if you have a employer plan with a previous employer, like a 403B, 457, if you have a 401k and it's a previous employer, you just call that previous employer's administrator and say, hey, I want to roll my money over into this IRA. But we tell you how to do it. We help you do it. But you fill out their form and they send the money. And so you've opened the account, you've funded it, now you invest. So you go shop for your asset. And this is super uh, crucial at this point that you don't just pick any asset, that you do your homework, that you understand the asset, you understand the risks, you do your due diligence to the people that are selling you this asset, own it. <laughs> for example, you know, you want to get online and Google them with the word fraud after if, if you're dealing with another person. If it's a piece of real estate you're just buying yourself, you know, you're, through your IRA, uh, then you want to make sure you understand all the potential pitfalls. What are you know, how do you plan for unexpected expenses? And you always want to leave a pad in your account. Uh, for example, right now, interest rates are going up, right? So a lot of people in private equity deals, when that private equity is, you know, ba backed by construction, those construction deals are, are facing, you know, higher loan amounts. And so there are a lot of capital calls. So does your IRA have a cushion to be able to handle something like a capital call? So some things to take into, into account. And that's why we have a consultation with you before 
you go forward. So we understand what you want to do, how you want to do it. But there's so much information. I mean, if you if you have a topic, if you want to learn tax liens, if you want to earn learn all about investing in raw land or mobile home parks, you, you Google it, you find meetups. There are so many podcasts. It's wonderful how we can go deep and uh, on different areas of expertise. Yeah. So as you're saying that, I'm hearing that you definitely have more freedom, right? But with more freedom, there's more risk versus just trusting some random person to put your money into a 401k. You Now you're in charge of it. So you definitely have to educate yourself. You do. I mean, I like to kind of joke around and say it's like Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and that, that's how Absolutely. it is. And there are some tools you can use, you know, uh, one is a called a checkbook IRA sometimes, but what it really is, is an IRA owned LLC. So you can have any of these accounts and any of these accounts can be the initial owner of a special purpose LLC. So it's the account, the retirement account, owning a special purpose LLC that's set up for this purpose. So your, your uh, retirement account would buy 100% of the initial units of that LLC. The LLC would have a checking account and now you can write checks but you can only write them either to acquire an asset or to pay the expenses of an asset, or maybe your account fees, nothing else. That's all you can do with it. Uh, but it could be handy if you wanna buy properties at auction. If you are invested in, in tax liens, those are very transaction intensive. So it's a good thing for that. So some people you know, like having that uh, IRA owned LLC. Absolutely. So on um, time out with the sports doctor, this is your final time out. So, you know, when I talk about money, a lot of times I get a little anxious or have fear. And I'm sure a lot of other people have that same thing, especially, you know, in medicine, we used to kind of see one, do one, teach one mentality. But being able to sometimes get outside of your realm can be scary. Yeah. But speak to why this is so important as far as investing and planning for your future. Why is now still the time? It's always the time. What do they say? Like the best time to plant a tree is either 10 years ago <laughs> or today. And we know we're going to be older. We're, we're older every day. So let's plan for it, you know? And yeah, it's definitely scary. It's, you know, scary for me too. It's scary to be an entrepreneur and open a company and learn so many things about how you do that. But even with real estate investing, it, and I did a little bit, but really getting into it and understanding how many aspects there are to it. And the way I learned is by being involved in real estate investment clubs and talking to people and hearing speakers talk about, you know, how do you deal with tenants? How do you, you know, how do you get the best deal? How do you find a good deal? And people have like checklists they'll share with you. I've never met more generous people than real estate investors. They want to tell you how to do it and be their competition. It's amazing. It's a really great, like abundance kind of a community in my experience. So but there's just a lot of people that want to help you learn when you want to get into the investing space. Just learn and do your homework, and then eventually you feel comfortable. Yeah, and I think community is important. That's one thing by being surrounding yourself with like-minded people who are willing to share their failures. I think that's really important. Everyone, sometimes you get in these groups and everyone wants to say, oh, I'm doing this, this, and this. But really to be able to get into a community where people can share their failures as well as their successes is very important. Um, so you can kind of learn and grow together. It's true. I mean, yeah, it's not all success. There's no successful person that doesn't have their failures because they, they come yeah. hand in hand. Absolutely. 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 So uh, Karen, if you can tell us how people can follow you on social media or how they can reach out to um, your company and get involved with your investment strategies. Well, it's easy to find our name because it's the letter U and then you direct as one word, you direct. You just Google yeah. that and you can find us. We're on, you know, Instagram and all the social media outlets. We even just got on TikTok with some videos. So, <laughs> yeah. so we're doing that. But not a lot of moving parts to an IRA to really, you know, show how they work, but uh, but we're working on it. You know? So you could find us anywhere. But the best way to get a hold of us is info at udirectira.com and ask any question you've got and we're happy to, you know, happy to answer. Perfect. Well, thank you for, you know, sharing this wealth of knowledge with us. And I can't wait to um, hear more about these share uh, self-directed IRAs moving forward. Thank you. Really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you can continue to get the updated episode. Until later, peace.
Sports. You don't want to miss. This is where life, sports, and medicine.